Hi, people. Should we start? So it's really strange to be speaking to a mic that doesn't make any sound. Uh, but I'm told this is for the recording. So let's do that. All right. So our speaker today is Nakul Shanai. Nakul is a magician. Um, we're going to learn what that means. Now, the funny thing is, like, my first meeting with Nakul was more than 10 years ago. I think it was somewhere around 2001 or 2002. Yes. It was really long back. We had met on this blogging site called Live Journal. And um, the first time we met, uh, Nakula had these really strange profile pictures. I couldn't even tell if he was a real person or not. Um, but <laughs> the first time we met, uh, he told me about some guy named Habermas. And I'm looking at this, is who the heck is Habermas? And he said, he defined this thing called the public sphere. And I said, what the fuck is a public sphere? You know, I mean, you're talking about a ball that's in public or what? And so uh, Nakul gave me this really long dump about this theory of society and the public sphere and how you can communicate in public with other people in the public, form public opinions, how the notion of a public works in the first place. And that kind of set me off on this journey where until then I had been a computer programmer and I had been a writer for a magazine. But as a writer for a magazine, my idea of doing this was you write, somebody reads, and that's about it. You know, and what Nakul did at that point was set me off on a path that looked not as writing and reading, but as community. Saying, what are you doing that influences people's opinions, that gets them together to talk to each other, build communities and so on. And since then, that's sort of been the pathway I took that ended up you know, building communities uh, with Parkham Bangalore, with HasGeek, and with various internet movements now. You know, so I have to really credit Nakul for setting me off on that path by giving me the little bit of theory that I needed to say, okay, this is not some random thing I'm thinking of. It's something that has been discussed and debated over decades, you know, building on work that has been built up over centuries. Okay. So Nakul, uh, thanks for that. And Thank over you. to you. Thanks, Kiran. That was like much more than <laughs> the intro I expected uh, to even claim a small part of the wonderful things you guys are doing uh, is, is phenomenal. So thank you. Um, Hi everybody, I'm Nakul, Nakul Shinoi, um, I now live in Bangalore and um, uh, this idea also needs to be credited of me coming on as part of this wonderful uh, session of HasGeek, the open house. Uh, recently I believe it was Prem Panikkar that went after Zainab and said uh, why don't you get Nakul to do a series on magic and its, it's relevance, it connects to uh, different things that we go through because most of us look at magic mostly as birthday entertainment, right? Where the kids are put thankfully along with the magician and the adults can run away, right? For their peace. Um, so, uh, and, and since if, if we said, okay, we're going to do a series on magic and the theory of magic and how to appreciate magic, we thought it might not interest too many people. So we said, uh, why don't we spin off on a recent uh, TEDx talk that I did, uh, which was where is magic and technology headed next uh, with all these things of internet of things uh, enchanted objects and things like that so uh, that's where this idea comes from for magic and technology so i'm going to run you through uh, it's, it's a geek conference right so i'm going to run you through some slides uh, and i'm going to try and tell you how i look at magic or how magic exists and, and then uh, we would uh, perhaps have some questions towards the end and hopefully enough interest that we actually have a second part to this series, right? Um, so like all things uh, normal, uh, we go to the God, right? To find out what is magic. And uh, so when you, because as magicians, we forget this, as magicians, uh, most of the times the problem is that uh, we come into magic because, let me tell you why I came into magic. Uh, as, as a very small kid, uh, I, I went to a magic show and uh, I guess it was in my school, I don't quite remember where, and this magician came on stage. Uh, he came on and he showed that he had one, two, three, four, five and six cards, okay? Um, and uh, from those uh, six cards, he uh, sort of showed those like this and then uh, he took one, he took two, he took three, threw them off and after a moment he showed that he still had one, two, three, four, five 
and six cards. I, I, I clapped. <laughs> yeah, I, I like the, I love the stunned silence, but I, I clapped, you know. Uh, I, I clapped. And, and, and it didn't stop there. He just showed that he still had one, two, three, four, five, uh, six cards. And from those six cards, many number of times he took one, two, three cards, threw them away, still showed that he had one, two, three, four, five, and six cards. Yeah, that's okay. Uh, it's, it's a long story because uh, the magician did this multiple times. I went up to him afterwards, tried to learn it from him, uh, but you know, I never learned that magic. So even now I don't know it. So I can't really show that to you. I love you, I love you, really. Uh, so, so, but as magicians, once we come into magic, we sort of forget why we are in, in magic. Because uh, at some point, uh, when we come into it, uh, you looking at it not as tricks, not as secrets, not as other things. You're looking at this as something very, very powerful that you can learn and make real things happen, right? Uh, uh, so this is spot on. It says the power of apparently influencing events by using mysterious or supernatural forces, having or apparently having supernatural powers. Uh, wonderful and exciting. Uh, because if it's not wonderful and exciting, it's not magic, right? Uh, it, it's, it's, it's a set of puzzles, it's a set of uh, perhaps uh, mysteries for people uh, to solve. And uh, primarily when you think uh, magic, um, Merlin comes to mind. Because Merlin has existed in uh, fantasy, in, in, in almost every uh, spin-off of, of magical stories and fables, you have Merlin or an equivalent to Merlin, right? Uh, uh, I just watched uh, Star Wars yesterday, so uh, yeah, so the Yoda, whatever, right? So, uh, but for most of us, this is the quintessential image of man uh, of 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 a magician. This was Dante. Uh, Dante was uh, in the early 1900s, uh, and sort of was this image that anybody looked at him had this, he's like this, right? Any day you meet him on the streets and stuff, he's walk, walking with his wand and, and things like that. And so you look at it and goes, must be a magician, right? We had, we had something like this from India too. This is the newer version of it, right? He's 70 by the way, not right now. So newer version, that's the junior. But we generally, I couldn't find a, a, a sort of a high res image for a PC Sarkar himself. Uh, so I, I went with Junior, he's, he's a phenomenal uh, person too. Uh, but uh, Sarkar was who took Indian magic to the world and became, along with uh, the other, like Dante, uh, the greatest magicians of the world tag was claimed by him from India, right? So these are different imagery of magic. We all have these various uh, imageries of magic. But primarily for me, uh, why I got into magic was Mandrake. Uh, the, how many of you here know Mandrik? Ah, my generation right there. Now you know Habermas and all that, right? So, uh, Mandrake was created by the same guy that created Phantom. Yeah? Uh, and Mandrake is the first superhero of the world. He's the first uh, crime-fighting superhero of the world. Predates Superman, Batman, and all those other guys that came later. Uh, he had powers. He could sort of stand there do this and make people see what he wanted them to see. He had hypnotic powers. He had uh, a cube, perhaps very similar to the Marvel Tasarat uh, cube, right? Um, uh, because he could use that cube to, com to increase his powers and communicate not just within the earth but across galaxies, okay? Um, most of our imagination or our expectation of the word magic, like it or not, comes from a uh, popular fiction, right? Uh, Mom's uh, Magician, the wonderful works of Enid Blyton, uh, that's just one of the covers. I mean, she's written so many books which enchant children into believing that if you sit on a chair, it's going to take you wherever you want, right? A wishing chair and things like that. Uh, the series by Holmberg and, and the wonderful series by Trudy Kahneman are some of the uh, recent ones. If nothing, we at least know this, right? So this would, this would connect to at least the current generation in a sense. Uh, even that is, I think, 10 years old now, right? Uh, or how much? 20 years. 
20 years. Yeah, I'm, I'm too old. Yeah, sorry. So uh, yeah, Harry Potter uh, came from books, went on to the movies. So again, uh, the imagery of magic, of how we see magic happen. And if, if not that, uh, me, right? I, I kept this for a reason today, right? Uh, so that I, I, I look like uh, Dr. Strange. Um, so yeah, uh, Dr. Strange, uh, again, uh, what, uh, uh, created much after, after Mandrake or, or Zatara for that matter. Uh, but then um, Zatara is, is a Mandrake equivalent that comes from uh, the DC side. Uh, Zatanna is more famous for given reasons. Uh, and uh, uh, Doctor Strange is, is the Marvel equivalent of it. And there's a lot of parallels between the stories of, or the powers and other things that you see uh, between these characters and how all this uh, helps people believe in it. But now let me take you a little back into what magic really is. Um, a recent book uh, that was released by Tas Chin, I think came out in the mid-2000s, 2006, 2007, uh, was called Magic. And uh, it chronicles magic from 1400s to 1950s. It's a fantastic book. It's, it's like this big. It's eight kilos. I know because I had to carry it as hand luggage from the US, uh, because that is the only way I could carry it without paying. Because it's a book, right? You can carry a book on your, in your hand. You're not charged for it. So uh, somebody at the, at the gate said, why is your bag so heavy? I said, I have a book in it. I said, take it in the hand. I said, awesome. Eight kilos, yeah, okay. But it's brilliant because it chronicles magic from the 1400s. So that's like, what, 600 years of, of history of magic, huge pictures, lithographs, and wonderful articles uh, in it by uh, Ricky Jay, uh, Jim Steinmeier, and others uh, who, are, who are famous in the magic community uh, and, and much of the US. But magic doesn't date there. Because it is, when we say 1400s, it actually is 1400s because uh, this painting by Bosch called The Conjurer is estimated to have been uh, drawn around uh, 1475 to 1480. Okay? And if you sort of see, it, it shows you uh, what is the classic of magic, the cups and balls. In one of the future sessions, uh, we will sort of get into breaking down some of these effects and try to understand, not, I'm not here to teach you the secrets of magic, right? But primarily break this down and understand why these are classics and, and why we should appreciate them slightly more, uh, not just from the enjoyment point, but also in terms of the, the effort that's required to perform some of this. Uh, very interesting. Magicians have always been linked to uh, pickpockets and other things because every time in India, you must have uh, this generation slightly difficult, but uh, uh, when I was small, I was going to say young, uh, there, was, uh, there used to be these street magicians that used to come. Back in Udupi, uh, on one of these street sides, road sides, they would start sitting down on the street and start performing, right? And then people would sort of, and we would also all go and start uh, trying to see what they were doing. They would perform for like half an hour, one hour, one and a half hours, because the point was to you know, hustle in a sense, right? Uh, uh, and, and sort of get people involved. I mean, the kind of things that it was brilliant. They would like uh, get a kid, Gori, uh, get a kid, uh, cut uh, their, their own kid, uh, cut his tongue off, show the tongue, and then sort of put it back again, right? Indian, Indian traditional magic is very, what's called bizarre magic or, or uh, Gori in a sense. Uh, and then they would put uh, the kid in a, in a bag and then put it in a, a small box. This is all on the ground, okay? It's an open ground. So there's no concept of a trap door and stage and things like that. No lighting. The sun is the lighting, right? And people all around it, standing all around, completely around, looking at this guy from a vantage point. Which is why Indian traditional magic is so far superior to whatever we now do. Because what we do is pretty much Western magic because we are on a stage. Indian magic doesn't quite transcend or, or translate to the stage. So uh, the Cups and Balls has its own Indian version, uh, which we will get to in a bit. Uh, but yeah, so this is uh, just putting dates on it, 1475. But that's not sort of, so okay, yeah. So the first book on magic, the first book, 
on magic, uh, was discovery of witchcraft. This was 1584, by Reginald Scott. Uh, I have reprints of these, right? I mean, they recently reproduced this uh, as a, uh, almost looking like the originals. Very nice. And you go through this, this is the first book on magic, and look at it. It is exposing magic. The first published book on magic for the public essentially tells people there is no such thing as magic. Why? Because the book was written to expose the so-called warlocks and witches and, and sorcerers and, and psychics and mediums, which we still are fighting now, right, after 600 years. Um, uh, that was the whole intent of this. This is not just in the US. If you sort of looked at uh, the German side of things, uh, they also had their own book in 1798 called the Natural Magic Book, which showed you how to put an arrow through your head. You can sort of see how it's done at the top. Uh, a sword through the stomach. We've all done this back in school and other things, right? Where you have sort of something. Uh, theater guys would mostly have, have used some things. But again, I feel it's extremely sad that some of the first books on magic essentially told people there's no such thing as magic. But let's go back some more because we are still talking 1400s. Let's go, to, go back to 2500 BC, to the tomb of Beni Hassan, where you see this imagery in that tomb. 2500 years back, we are in 2000 AD right now. That's 4500 years back, where this effect is, or this imagery is, is largely looked on as a depiction of cups and balls. Okay? Uh, there are others who say this is making bread. So let's, uh, there's, there's both perspectives to it, okay? Um, but if we actually go even further back, we go about 5,000 years back, and we go to the 18th to 16th century, there was something called the Vestka Papyrus, which is actually the first published book or collection of handwritten literature, which writes, and you can, you can uh, sort of do a search for this, uh, Dedi, the magician's name was Dedi. He performed in the court of Cheops, the, the, the pharaoh who built uh, the, the, the pyramids, right? Uh, so there is a complete, uh, the, the, these imagery are new clearly, people have, have drawn this out now, but uh, there is a detailed account of the performance of Dedi in the court of Cheops. One of the effects, um, let me ex sort of tell you. So it, it describes this. Dedi came to the court, everybody was watching him, and he had a duck with him. So he brought the duck, and he, the duck was walking around. He catches the duck, and he sort of brings the head off the duck. Okay, so he cuts the head off the duck, and uh, lets the duck there, the head is off, decapitation. And then moments later, he actually takes the head and pops it back on, and the duck walks off fine. Okay, and a lot of other effects are in detail uh, written under uh, called uh, Tales of Magicians. Um, again, five thousand years back, so uh, uh, pretty pretty fascinating. India, uh, we had our own uh, contributions. So this is your traditional uh, Indian street magicians. This imagery is from 1888, uh, called the Celebrated Mango Tree Trick. Uh, anybody is here has ever seen the Indian mango tree? Yes. Yes. So uh, I had the occasion, and there are still very few, perhaps a handful of performers in India, street performers in India, who actually do this and do this very, very well. Because the setting is the same as I said, they do it in an open ground, you are all around them, nothing for them to hide and stuff. Uh, so they, they sort of start with a seed. And so they take you through the whole process of, tree, uh, of, of seed to tree to the mango fruit in a matter of 20, 25 minutes. You literally see them plant the seed, put some water, talk to you, and then they cover it, they take it off, and there's a small sapling. They take it off, and then they're slightly bigger. They cover it, take it off, and now it's it's full like a bush. And after a moment, you see that there's a mango, and they call somebody. This mango is right here, right? It's not like stuck by uh, glue or something. And people say, no, it is real. And then uh, they take it off and give, and the guy goes back with a real mango. Uh, the last time I saw this was in Trivandrum uh, at a at a All India Magic get together, 
and it was not the mango season. And, and I'm like, so, I mean, the planning, I'm not saying it, he produced it from somewhere because magic can't create something, right? While we do show you that we break the laws of physics, we are using other laws of physics or geometry or, or some other law to create that illusion for you, right? Oh, by the way, when I say illusion, I don't mean you're mass hypnotized. No, illusion means it's an illusion uh, for us. It's, it's an industry terminology. If you see somebody cut on stage and half, they are being cut in half on stage. Now, how? That's a different topic, right? But it is not uh, a lot of people walk up later and sort of say, uh, so that was hypnosis. No, okay. So, uh, but coming back, so this effect, uh, and, and this is the basket trick I was uh, talking about earlier. The terminology of Indian magic itself, all the foreign magic are, are referred to as magic. All Indian effects are referred to as trick. The mango tree trick, the Indian basket trick, the great Indian rope trick. The great Indian rope trick was a, a construct uh, that is a session by itself uh, was a legend uh, came out because of the original fake news. Okay, uh, a friend of mine, Dr. Peter Lamont, uh, did his uh, a very nice book called *The Rise and Fall of the Indian Rope Trick*, where he actually traces back the genealogy of the uh, Indian rope trick, and finally leads to a 1940 newspaper a gazette uh, in, in New York that published this story about this guy coming to India and watching it. It was just make believe. Uh, but it went viral. It was the first instant of something going viral. It went so viral that every book, every uh, uh, magazine, newspaper at that time carried it. And when uh, they later put a, a, a rejoinder saying this was not true, nobody bothered. <laughs> right? And what did it do? It had magicians from across the West coming to India saying, I want to see the Indian rope trick. And the Indian magicians go, yeah, yeah, I can show. What is that? <laughs> we, we, will, we will show. Give us some time. Right? And so this was one of the performances of the Indian rope trick uh, by the great Karachi. Uh, he was an Australian. No, nothing to do with India. But, so, but then it helped because this imagery that people had in their minds, which was you have a rope, you throw the rope up, the rope stands straight, a child is called, the child climbs up, and disappears into the clouds, Jack and the Beanstalk, uh, and then uh, you go and say, call him, come, come, he doesn't want to come down. So the magician now takes a sword and walks up, uh, and then uh, there's some noise, and then limbs fall down from the clouds. Uh, the magician comes back, picks all that, puts it in that box you saw earlier, yeah, and uh, so here's the box. Yeah, yeah, this box. So he puts all those things into that box, and opens the box and the kid walks out again and claps and the ropes fall down, right? So this was the description of the effect in that gazette. And uh, in 2000, uh, yeah, 2000, Udupi, where I am from, had an international uh, magic convention where a Delhi magician, a Delhi street magician called Ishamuddin performed the Indian rope trick. Uh, people like uh, Richard Wiseman, uh, Dr. Peter Lamont uh, came down, uh, they were good friends by then, uh, to watch this and chronicle it. Uh, of course, uh, the kid just climbed up and came back down and the rope collapsed. That's about it, right? But, but still, to do it in pretty much closer to the real story, as, or rather the fake story that had appeared, uh, was, was a great achievement for magic. So, yeah, so that's the Indian rope trick. Now, why am I telling all this? Why, it, it all links back to the wonderful quote by Arthur C. Clarke, a, a very good magician himself, who said, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. A most often used quote, the third law, uh, and pretty much uh, you know, has been written about, has been uh, said to be untrue, that's not what he meant, etc. Okay, but for now, let's use it as it's face value and look at um, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Now look at all that the stories we talked about. At some level, every magician from Chiop, uh, from Didi, 
to uh, Karachi to the unnamed Indian performers who went in front of people and performed what they did were using science or technology of the day in unique ways, in ways where people who were scientists would not relate back to it and sort of would see it as being paranormal or supernatural. Exhibit A. We are talking of automatons now, we are talking of AI. Do you know the first AI was in 1770s? This was called the, Grand, the Great Turk. The Great Turk made its first appearance in 1770. It, it lived on for almost 100 years. Um, and it was this, it was this box which had, a, which had a mannequin, the mannequin mood. Uh, I have seen a, a later uh, version of this in one of the magic uh, museums. Um, and these were the workings of it that you could sort of see through. So that like, you know, you see the box, they show the box, they close the box. And now you sit against, Deep Blue came much later, right? You sit against this machine and the machine starts playing chess. And the machine defeated everybody it played with. So much so that at that time, Napoleon himself played it. And Napoleon, the story goes, tried to cheat. The third time he cheated, it just swapped all the pawns away. Of course, the, as you can sort of see from the courtesy, um, the Turk as opposed chess playing Robert was a hoax that started an early trend, blah, 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 right? But this is the point that, you know, magicians have always found. Um, ways of, of creating things, of trying to show that technology exists when it does not, or to use technology in ways uh, that people can't quite uh, fathom or explain. Uh, John Eugene Robert Houdin considered as um, the father of modern magic. Most of modern magic you see, which is the stage-based uh, thing where, you know, a magician is wearing a suit, a uh, hat or not today, uh, was, was him. He was the first stage, modern stage magician. He created something called the enchanted orange tree. See, it's not orange tree trick, the enchanted orange tree. It was a mechanical version of exactly doing what the Indian street performers were doing, which was the mango tree trick. Okay, um, and, and here he was essentially, uh, he had this uh, same thing. So he had, he had a box from which a plant would grow and from that plant you would sort of see uh, flowers blooming and, uh, and then you would see um, orange and sort of you could pluck the orange, right? Uh, nobody could eat it, that's different, but till that point. And then you had these uh, flying, uh, uh, a silk sort of a handkerchief that would be uh, flown by butterflies. Um, you had various kind of things. Now, what was fantastic was he was a brilliant clock worker. So, most of the magic he did had a relation to clockwork. Watch, watchmaker, right? So, a lot of this was Roberts in that sense, right? Uh, not powered by electricity, but by cranks and levers and things like that. So, um, this is called the light and heavy chest. Uh, so in 1850s again, uh, once he had sort of retired from stage performance, he was requested by the, the king of France or something like that to actually make a trip to the Middle East because they were just sort of making, the Western civilization was making inroads into uh, the Middle East. And so um, they sent uh, Robert Houdin to make the people there believe that Western civilization is far, far advanced and our skills and magic, etc., is far advanced. So what he did was, was this. Uh, he called all the, um, all the chieftains, all the tribe leaders and the strongest men of the tribe um, and he had this small trunk with him that he brought and kept it down and he called a person and uh, he asked him to pick it up. The person was able to easily pick it up. He said, keep it down again. 
And he said, now look at me, and I'm going to strip you of all your powers. Now pick it up. And now what you're seeing is that scene. No matter what he could do, he could not pick up that same light box that was there. The backstory, electromagnets had made their appearance in the Western civilization. So that was used so intelligently and used to create this wonderful illusion of a box or, or rather a person being stripped of his powers, of all his strength and the concept of my God better than your God, my, my society better than your society, right? Uh, the scene, the, that scene is sort of immortalized in this movie, The Illusionist. Uh, there's one also, uh, there's this other scene uh, where he takes the sword and he puts it on the stage and he walks off and he asks the prince to come and lift it and for all the life of the prince, he can't move that sword. And in the movie, they actually show that somebody is operating a crank which operates a electromagnet. I, I love The Illusionist uh, because it, the most of the magic that they show uh, 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 is, is actually uh, performable. And, and it's such a brilliant way of, of uh, denoting what, what magic can do. And the wonderful thing that a magician thinks four steps ahead. For people who have not uh, seen the movie, I just sort of spoiled it for you. Yeah, um, and so magicians have always been fascinated with dreams. Magicians have been fascinated with breaking every rule that we believe in and sort of breaking the laws of science. One of the classic, uh, I mean Copperfield himself has done immense effects like walking through the Great Wall of China and things like that, but what uh, really got him world acclaim was the flying because he was the first uh, human in that sense, uh, a magician of course, to, to literally fly without seemingly with any, any kind of uh, support. Uh, he, would, he would literally uh, get somebody from the audience, hold them and then float around the, uh, float around the stage. Uh, I've had the occasion of watching it. It's, it's unbelievable. It's like even as a magician, even if you sort of understand what are the philosophies and what are the tricks you can use, it's still like you want to believe when you watch something like this. You want to believe that magic is, is real. You can watch it. I mean, most of these are from YouTube. So you just go on and search David Copperfield flying. You'll get to watch that. Um, dynamos walking on water. Uh, the Thames River. It's, it's classic. Uh, by the way, right now, I think Patanjali or somebody is posting some videos like this. Uh, sorry. No. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, who was that? Yeah. So uh, we, we are right now. Sorry, I'm, I'm digressing. But we are sort of having people blindfold themselves and, and, and be able to read. Uh, similarly, a recent thing was that you do yoga and you can sort of levitate on water, right? Uh, so we are like, yeah, right, uh, watch this video and then we can talk. So yeah, but, but again, this brings uh, to life one of the greatest imagery that is in all our epics, right? We had in, in, in all epics, people walking on, on the sea or, or river or water or whatever that is. And that's what the magician is making uh, come true. Oh, by the way, today morning uh, I saw, or uh, just now, I saw this video of, of the, uh, the Ram Setu. So it's sort of going viral again for whatever reason. Uh, and and uh, my comment was, hey, great place to go and perform that effect. Because if, 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 if that is there, just about this height, I can, you know, possibly. But, okay, but again, it's about breaking rules because Blaine performed wonderful effects of uh, standing on a pillow and, and sitting in a box, not eating for 48 days and things like that. But this recent thing that he did was a bullet catch, which has been performed so many times in the past. Uh, the, the larger, there was a magician called Chang Ling Su who died on stage performing this. Um, his, his real name was David Williams' son, or I might get the second name wrong. Um, but he performed this recently where he took technology to such a level where he is essentially saying, see, you can see. Um, the laser that's in the mouth, uh, aimed at the mouth, you're sort of seeing the, the, the bullet uh, or, or the light of the bullet and things like that. And, um, and the backstory is that he almost killed himself performing this. So, but, but again, like, that's what magicians want to do. They want to break rules of science by using other modes of science. 
and nothing better than uh, Michael Jackson, uh, to me one of the greatest magicians we have had, uh, telling us why he loves to create magic, uh, to put something together that's so unusual, so unexpected, that it blows people's heads off. Something ahead of the times, five steps ahead of what people are thinking. Think back to the illusionist. So, um, this is a friend of mine, uh, Derek Delgadio. He's right now performing a show uh, in New York. Uh, I think this, this was supposed to be the last week. Uh, I'm not sure because the show was supposed to be a two-week show. It's gone on for six months now. Uh, and the show is produced by Neil Patrick Harris, directed by Frank Oz. Yoda? Yeah, okay. Uh, but why I put this was this. It says, wonder is a rare commodity these days. Beautiful, tender, astonishing. Why is wonder so rare today? Because I recently, uh, not so recently, but five years back was performing an event uh, for SAP uh, in Bombay. And I just finished my act and stepped off. The guy sitting in the front seat, an Israeli, walked up to me, said, wonderful show. I said, thank you. He said, no, 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 I mean it, wonderful. Because I just checked you out and I couldn't find out how you did what you did. Guys, I'm not talking five minutes later. I'm not talking ten minutes later. I have just taken one step off the stage. So a person, I'm not sure if she's already Googling me. But, but essentially, that's how our audiences are today. You see something, earlier you would go back, think over it, ponder about it. Uh, you now go to uh, Google or, or yeah, generally, and, or Bing if you wish. Uh, go and, and, and type uh, how this was done and you like it or not, hopefully not, uh, get to see some version of how that can be performed. That's why wonder is not there. And so what Derek did is one of the finest performers and what Derek did essentially is, is create this very intimate show where everything is so unexplainable. At the end of the show, you really go back saying, "Did I was I even at the show? Did that even happen?" And and in today's age, that's 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 wonderful. So why am I again talking about all this? Because we are in an age where magic is all around us. Uh, this was the, or rather, is uh, the Chimera wand. Uh, the Chimera wand is a universal remote of sorts. It's shaped like a magic wand. You can program it to, I think, 30, when it launched, to about 30 different devices. Uh, you could set up your own gestures. You could be Harry Potter and go, change channel now, right? Um, that's there. It's available for anybody who wants to spend $60 or 80 I don't remember. But, and then uh, we are talking of everything being controlled with either small gadgets on us or, or even not uh, kinetics and other things where everything is, either the TV interacts with us much more than we interact with it. Uh, uh, so this is what our audiences are getting used to. Gesture, I don't want to watch this channel, do this, it shifts over to another channel. It's a very simple example. But again, this is what an audience is, or people, our people are experiencing day in and day out, uh, especially with you guys. It's, it's much more than that because you, you work with technology. So your expectation of what or your knowledge of what technology can do or your expectation of what technology can do is, is much, much higher. Which is why I love Nick Harkaway's quote. It says, it's not that any sufficiently advanced technology is magic. It is that any technology taking place beyond the threshold of our senses is. Let me try and explain this quote. I recently saw a, a video that went viral of a, of a drone. A drone that uh, the person stood and controlled with gestures. I'm sure everybody has seen it. He did this, it went wherever he went, it followed him and things like that. Now these are things that exist and these are things that exist that are known in the public domain. So the moment I, as an individual, know that something like this exists, my expectation of what kind of technological uh, uh, acts are possible 
is much more than that. So it doesn't really matter whether that technology exists or not. Because if I stand here now and, and I wake that person up and I say, hey, hi, stand up, I'm going to read your mind and I read the mind, you're most probably going to get an answer that says, okay, you Google me, right? Uh, if, or if, if I ask somebody to say, write something or, or read something, it's most probably going to be like, yeah, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth technologies exist, so I know you got whatever I, you know. So, so it becomes pretty difficult. So, I mean, my, my recent example for this is, imagine somebody comes on stage, levitates, turns around, or I right now turn around and vanish. Half of you are going to go and say, hey, where did you get that 3D projection from? Right? So that's, now it's not about whether 3D projection is at that level today, but we know 3D projection is available. And so that must be 3D projection. Come on, we had our prime minister appearing everywhere, right? So surely it's possible. Um, so right now, we are wearing at least two or three of these devices on us, right? Right? And uh, this is what we are used to with us or people around us and we know the capabilities of these devices. Uh, and so as a performer, as a magician, it is not anymore enough to think of using technology before others can use it, like the electromagnet and things like that. That's out. And it's also not enough to use technology in, in unique, weird ways that perhaps still mystify and astound people because people's expectations are way different and so whatever we do it sort of goes to people have their own meanings or reasons why that magic happened so all in all it makes an interesting age to be performing magic as is the true with most performing arts today Right? I'm really thankful that so many people turned up uh, for this here in person and I'm hoping some more are watching. But um, it's very difficult nowadays to actually step out and go to a place to watch an event, whether it's paid, free, whatever that is. Because it's so much easier to open our phones and look at world class, world's best content right there. Right? It's not about just watching anything. It's now I might be the best in the area or I might be the best in the country or I might be the best available at that point in time, which was good till very recently. But now not anymore because you can at, on your laptops or on the TVs or on the fire sticks uh, or whatever that is, perhaps holographic projections, uh, watch any act that you want. And so it makes it all the more challenging to sort of perform, show something. So it brings this whole question of where is magic headed? Uh, because magic has, like I said, at a various, to a great extent, as you saw in the slides, um, been ahead of technology. Then there was a phase where magicians just started using technology in, in unique ways, mixing two or three things uh, and, and trying to sort of show that, hey, we're different. But now, this whole thing of um, how are we going to even look at how do we entertain somebody and mystify them at the same time. Um, so that's my last slide. So I thought, uh, I, I don't have an answer for that yet. But I thought if I was trying to do that, and for today because it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a tech crowd, I would really go completely basic. I would perhaps go perhaps not 5,000 years, but, but sort of as back as I can to try, and, to try and do something which clearly cannot have any technological connects and so can only have real magical connects. Yeah? Uh, can I ask you to join me? Hi. Don't cut me then, I'm not cool. Oh, that was not planned today, so don't worry. I didn't find, I asked them about the tables. The tables wouldn't support, otherwise I would have done that. I'm kidding. Okay. Sit down. <laughs> so, um, okay, 
so I'm, I'm going to um, give you an experience that uh, you have uh, never experienced before, okay? Um, uh, perhaps that's what I was, yeah, so if you can just switch that off for a moment. That's already an experience he's never gone through before, because he's sitting down in front of a bunch of people with light, a projector light being uh, shot at him. No, it doesn't work, okay. Uh, okay, so um, I need, yes, so um, I have two things, choose one. What's your name? Prithviraj. Prithviraj. Uh, do you want to change your mind? Sure. That's the one you want. You can change your mind if you want. Okay. I told you, Prithviraj, that I'm going to give you an experience you've never had before. I think I just did. Because I walked up to you with a fancy looking box, which normally holds a 4 GB drive, opened it and, and offered a set of Toothpicks. Asked you to choose one. You did. Then I upped it by asking you to change your mind. Has anybody ever done this to you? No. <laughs> I deliver what I promise, guys. Now, I am going to up that by one. An experience you never ever had before. Sign the toothpick. So that if, you know where this is headed, yeah. So if you ever, you sign, sign, it's okay. Sign it, sign it, it's okay. Okay, uh, so if you ever see that again, you would remember it. Or you would, you would recognize it. To some extent, yeah. You want to change your mind with some other toothpick at this point? Okay, okay. So again. Have you ever, sir, taken a toothpick and signed it? No. We'll up that. Um, can I take that from you for a minute? I'm just going to place that there. Can I ask you to hold your hands out like this? And um, what I want you to do is slightly apart the hands. Perfect. I am going to take your signed toothpick. And I'm going to keep it inside, like that. Hold on to it, so that in a moment, I can uh, give that to you like this here. Feel, feel, feel through it. Can you feel it? Ho uh, just, just hold it with two hands, like that. Have you ever done this before? Break it. You want to break it a couple of more times? Sure? Yes, thank you. Have you ever done broken a toothpick in this manner? What if I were to say yes? <laughs> no, no, no. Okay, good. Because then my whole idea would fall flat. So hold on to your hand like this. Keep your other hand on top like this. Now, um, oh. I, I, I actually should have uh, worn this. I, I forgot. I meant to change. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. Uh, are, you, are you a Doctor Strange fan? I don't know what this is. <laughs> <laughs> works. Works, right? Works. So, do you know what this is? Some, Some pendant. It's, it's, it's the eye of Agamotto. The eye of Agamotto helps Doctor Strange change time. And if you'll hold your hand like this, I'm going to try turning back time. I don't know if you noticed, but I kept track exactly of when you broke the toothpick. Now I'm going to
this is tricky because if I turn back time too much, then the toothpick won't be signed. Yes, I think that would work. Thank you very much. I'm sure you've had an experience that you've never ever had before, right? Thank you very much, guys. Okay, okay, hard audience. Uh, let's, let's sort of take this hand, hold it, hold it here like this together. Now, now here's the thing. If I managed to get into my Doctor Strange guys and turn back time, to that specific moment where it was before he broke the toothpick, it would be intact. If it was slightly later, it would still be broken. You get that, right? Or, or if we go slightly more back, it would not be signed. Okay. Would you sort of? Yep, it's the same topic. You can now take that back, frame it. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, yeah, guys, that's what I, I had for you uh, today. But uh, thank you very much. Question is after my last slide, no? <laughs> yeah, so. The, yeah, it's already projected there, so it doesn't matter. So, so uh, yeah, the last slide basically just says keep calm and make magic. So, uh, thanks a lot. It was a pleasure uh, talking to you, running you through what I see as, as, as interesting snippets of the history of magic. Uh, and we will sort of... Uh, keep going forward with some more interesting aspects of uh, the different types of magic and, and theories of magic and things like that. Um, but yeah, thanks for being such an awesome audience and for enjoying it. Thank you very much. And thank you for everybody watching. Thank you.